So, can you see it? Yep. Great. Um, yeah, then good morning, everybody again. Um, and thanks a lot uh, for Sean and all the other organizers for compiling this interesting program and inviting me to that. Um, so my name is Robert Haschke from Bielefeld University. Um, and I'm heading the uh, grasping lab over there. Oh, okay. Um, so usually I start my talks uh, with these old uh, videos uh, from Professor Johansson, um, which you probably all know. Uh, so on, on the um, left side, um, the woman here um, lights up these matches as usual. But on the right side, uh, their skin uh, was, was anitized, uh, so she cannot actually feel anything anymore. And these videos nicely illustrate um, that tactile sense is, of course, important uh, for manipulation. Um, but on the other hand, uh, finally, she managed uh, to um, light these matches anyway uh, without tactile sensing. Uh, so we can kind of compensate. Um, so we, we have both vision and uh, tactile available, and actually they work together uh, in order to achieve good results. Um, and typically in robotics nowadays, uh, we consider either one or the other uh, cue only. And um, yeah, that's why we have this uh, interesting workshop here uh, to bring them together. Uh, so that's the out outline of my talk. Um, first, I will um, consider our grasping pipeline and um, talk about our tactile sensors, uh, a little bit about uh, tactile serving, and finally, how can we learn to uh, exploit tactile sensors. Um, so the typical grasping pipeline is like um, visually localizing an object. Um, then we more or less close our eyes and then grasp, um, or first of all, choose a, a grasp, of course, uh, but then finally we, we grasp the object without vision uh, because still um, object in hand or um, object in hand uh, recognition is still an issue. Uh, primarily because of the uh, occlusions. And um, yeah, we, we, in our case, use tactile feedback uh, in order to at least know that we failed or that we um, succeeded to grasp an object. Um, so for object detection and localization, uh, we rely on 3D scene segmentation, um, which essentially built on, on these um, surface normal images. Uh, so this is just an, an, a depth image uh, acquired using a Kinect camera. Um, and we compute uh, the surface normals uh, across the image. Uh, from those, we can detect 3D object axes, uh, which we can use to, to first of all, uh, segment surface patches. And these surface patches then need to be combined uh, to form object hypothesis. Um, and this is done using this um, graph cut algorithm here. Uh, so if we form a graph of, of potentially adjacent um, surfaces, which could belong to an object, um, as you see here. Uh, but then there are some extra edges in, in there, which need to be cut. Uh, this is done using graph cut, and then we come up finally uh, with local clusters uh, of surfaces uh, which form individual objects. And indeed, uh, we can perform quite well on a classical um, object segmentation database, uh, ranging from simple to complex scenes. Uh, so for the complex scenes, um, the uh, accuracy um, drops a little bit uh, because we have some regions which we cannot nicely um, distinguish anymore. But it's sufficient uh, to, to localize the objects. And then we, if we have segmented those objects, uh, we can use super quadrix fitting uh, in order to fit a basic geometric shape modeled by these super quadrix uh, shapes here, which range from uh, cubes to cylinders um, and spheres. Um, and the key um, extension, let's say, to, to um, standard approaches is that we use um, a symmetric cost function. So usually, uh, 
it's only measured the distance uh, of a data of the data points to the supercritic surface, which is given by this uh, implicit function essentially. Uh, but we also need to measure the other way around. Um, so in order to measure um, that our model function uh, or our, our model uh, modeled by this supercritic um, is not really is not much much larger. Um, or doesn't extend uh, into the back, for example, where we do, don't have data points. Um, and we, we use uh, constraints to, to only look for shapes um, of spheres, cylinders, and, and uh, um, boxes to make it more robust. And then we can, based on, on the detected geometry, uh, just choose our grasp and, and perform the grasp. So that's uh, what you have seen in, in the very first video. Uh, what I usually don't show uh, are these outtakes here, um, so all the failures. Um, of course, we might have failures because um, our camera calibration is poor, so we are um, a few centimeters off uh, and just barely um, touch the object. Or in the middle uh, here, grasping the bulb, you see essentially the thumb here is not closing fast enough and the fingers are already pushing out the object from the grasp. And the same kind of uh, appears for placing, uh, where it's even more evident. Uh, so here the, the thumb opens too slow, pushing the, the uh, box out um, from its intended position uh, uh, and uh, thus failing the placing. And of course, in these situations, uh, we should use uh, tactile sensing in order to close the fingers um, uniformly uh, and apply the same kind of amount of force or um, maintain force stability all the time. Um, and this is something we are just working on um, for, for closing. Um, the group of Professor Allen um, uh, last year presented another approach, uh, namely a neural network, uh, which was trained um, to yeah, classify essentially whether uh, the current situation um, is good for, for continuing grafting. Uh, so each um, cycle, uh, a deep neural network here decides uh, whether it should start over um, and, and try another um, grasping approach direction, or it should continue with each individual finger to close, the, uh, to close uh, the grasp and finally lift the object. Okay, for all that, of course, we do need tactile sensors. Um, and we started developing tactile sensors uh, many years ago. Um, so this is only showcasing our tactile sensors for the shadow robot hands, uh, which we have in our lab. Uh, so these are the fingertip sensors, uh, which provide 12 texels here. You can see them uh, as these meander-like um, yeah, electrodes. Um, and they perfectly fit into the fingertips of, of the shadow hands. So these are 3D shaped electrodes covered by some piezo um, sensitive foam. And uh, they give quite nice um, yeah, sensor information and we can even estimate um, the force direction uh, from the uh, location and, and orientation uh, of each individual texel. Um, to cover also uh, all the other phalanges here uh, of the shadow hand and, and all, uh, also the palm, we developed um, flexible conductive fabrics-based sensors. Um, so these are um, just a few layers of piezo-resistive um, and conductive fabrics, um, only two to three millimeters in thick, uh, uh, thickness. Um, and they now provide um, tactile sensors all over uh, the palmer side, essentially, uh, of our hands. So altogether, we have 92 uh, tactile sensors per hand. However, these, uh, particularly these fabric-based sensors are not too sensitive. You need to press rather hard. And particularly detecting this first touch contact uh, which we have seen uh, is responsible to pushing out an object, particularly um, objects which uh, tend to roll away. Um, so there we need to, to, to improve on the first touch sensitivity. 
And one idea to do so um, was barometer-based tactile sensing. So also that sensor was already developed in 2013. Um, and the idea is, is very simple. We just take um, a barometer sensors um, used usually for air pressure measure measurements um, and mold them into silicone. And the silicone essentially um, yeah, acts as a, as a um, flexible flesh uh, distributing the force across um, the sensors. Um, However, the, the uh, package size of these MEMS sensors here was rather large uh, back in 2013. Nowadays, we have much smaller chips, um, only size two by two millimeters. And so we can pack them quite densely in a, in a five by four um, array here, for example, on a one centimeter by one centimeter coarsely um, yeah, uh, area. Um, however, going so small uh, comes with, a, uh, with an issue. Uh, so essentially, the orifice, uh, which um, is um, part of, these, um, um, of, of the housing of these sensors, is actually too small to let the silicon uh, flow in. So what we essentially get is that we have an air gap here. Um, and the silicon is not, not really entering um, or not really touching the sensor. Um, and yeah, based on the different amounts of um, air here, we, we get very different uh, behavior across different sensors. Um, so what we did as actually is to modify those uh, housings and drill a larger hole uh, in order to increase the orifice here. And this, uh, yeah, it's much better results as we can see in this figure here. Uh, so here we have um, the behavior of um, two unmodified cells um, where we have this, this strange air gap. Uh, and we see that they kind of follow more or less exactly um, this temperature curve here in red. While the modified uh, sensors, so with the uh, increased orifice, um, have perfect uh, temperature stability here. So these two lines are the two modified sensors of, of this test board here uh, shown at the top. And also looking at the sensor character characteristics, we see uh, that the two modified sensors have very nice linear behavior across the whole force range, um, while the modified sensors show very different behavior. So here's one and here's the other one. Uh, so one sensor is, is, um, has a very low or small slope um, and is not very sensitive for this reason. Um, the other one is quite sensitive, but uh, it's kind of too sensitive or it has, uh, is kind of preloaded and um, saturates uh, very early here. Um, so we want to go for these modify modifications. And Next step, of course, was to kind of fit those sensors uh, onto our shadow hands. So we used flex PCB um, to spread these sensors. You see them here uh, as these uh, light um, squares uh, to spread them um, on the palm side of our hands. Uh, so we have altogether 60 texels, uh, which we can sample at 100 Hertz, and they measure both pressure and temperature. And as you see in these images, um, we can nicely uh, identify here um, the shape of the object on just uh, holding them um, on the hand. And um, yeah, these objects are chosen explicitly to be very lightweight uh, to illustrate that we can really measure very small forces here. And actually, um, the, the uh, color range uh, of this of, of the, um, tactile visualization here in Arvis um, is only covering five per mil, uh, five per mil um, of the overall uh, force range the sensor can um, cover, which is, uh, I guess, 16 or 24 bits even. Um, so we have a really good resolution. And uh, as you have seen before, uh, uh, the behavior is extremely linear. Um, which is in, in strong contrast uh, to the piezo-sensitive sensors, which have a very nonlinear behavior. 
However, um, supporting so everything onto this flex PCB, we still have um, some strong remaining temperature de dependency, which seems to be even stronger um, than in the uh, test board we, we uh, studied before. So here what you see uh, are the 60 temperature curves, so to say, um, starting from a um, you know, cold situation, uh, and then the sensors heat up uh, due to energy consumption in, in the uh, flex PCB, uh, and this is a very slow process, as you see. Um, or we have kind of drift then, um, and additionally, or uh, here on top, we see um, the um, calibrated uh, pressure, which of course uh, obviously strongly correlates uh, with the temperatures here. And we need to find out um, a good calibration method now um, to kind of compensate for this um, um, temperature dependency. And also figure out why we see uh, uh, such a variance across uh, the different sensors, although they are uh, very similar essentially. So also the uh, variance is only one, uh, uh, one degree of Celsius. Okay, so having seen all the hardware, the question is how can we use this hardware also for um, manipulation? And one interesting question for manipulation is of course, um, yeah, following surfaces automat automatically like shown here, um, so to, to explore the surface and gather tactile um, point clouds, so to say, uh, in order to get an impression uh, of the shape of the object. Sorry, am I running out of time? And the basic idea is um, to use very simple controllers, um, namely, for example, um, to, to control the contact force, we move along the normal direction just um, to move the, uh, to control the contact position. We just move on our sensors along uh, in, in a tangential plane, um, or we can also rotate, uh, roll about the sen um, yeah, roll about the contact position, um, and for yeah, axis orientation, uh, for example, if we, we contact um, an object like this. Uh, then we can just rotate our sensors in order to align the sensor. Um, and the, the control approach is rather simple. So we have um, these tactile features, contact position estimated um, from um, the, the, all the contact points and the contact force. And maybe using PCA, we can also uh, compute um, the, the object um, orientation on our sensor. And then we use a very simple um, mapping function, uh, which translates those um, tactile feature errors onto a corresponding motion of the tactile sensor. Um, so for example, uh, the Z component here um, just translates uh, along um, the normal direction or into a motion along the normal direction of the sensor. Um, these two components um, guarantee this translational motion in, in the tangential plane uh, in order to correct for, for position errors. And these two ones here um, achieve rolling uh, about the contact sensor, uh, about the contact position. So a very simple uh, matrix um, in order to map error, tactile feature errors onto um, tactile sensor uh, motions. And then we might have a um, task specific projection matrix, which just picks um, certain aspects here of, of this um, twist vector. And finally, uh, we use the adjoint matrix um, to transform the twist uh, in the tactile sensor frame into a global frame where we can then apply inverse kinematics, integrate uh, to yield our uh, position control the position control signal Q. And here essentially we can enter a higher level control signals either in the local tactile frame or in the uh, global world frame. And we can use that for example to, to apply visual serving. Um, and that's what we have, uh, what we see here. We have a fiducial marker here on top uh, of this um, cylinder. 
and then we can approach the object roughly based on the cylinder and you have seen that the uh, tactile sensors autonomously uh, align um, and oppose each other by sliding across the surface and then we can um, move the uh, hands around um, using this tactile servering approach um, maintaining always uh, the same uh, contact force to, to manipulate the object. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, that's why I stop here um, because I have shown these um, slides last, last year anyway or also. Uh, so this is just about um, learning how to um, manipulate, um, uh, as you all know, uh, open eyes work on, on um, yeah, solving the Rubik's cube and, and uh, uh, aligning um, these cubes here, for example. And we just studied how can we improve this learning curve um, if we also consider tactile sensing. And uh, of course, we can show <clears throat> that learning is slightly faster if we can consider tactile serving or tactile sensing and vision um, together. Any questions? Thank you, Robert. That, that's a great talk. Uh, we, we do have uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, actually, there are two. So the first one is, uh, what type of piezo-resistive form are you using? Um, that's just the packaging foam uh, for, for electric devices, uh, which is um, yeah, conductive a little bit. And if you essentially press it together um, due to these uh, conductive um, fibers of, uh, uh, what is it, um, Kohlenstoff, I don't know. Uh, uh, due to the conductive fiber, the, the conductivity increases if you press it together. Uh, so very simple packaging show a uh, phone. Carbon. Sorry. Carbon. Carbon. Thanks. Carbon fibers. Carbon fibers. <clears throat> Thank you, Casper. Uh, another question. Uh, also, do you have any long-term stability data of the maps uh, biometric sensors since they are originally designed to measure pressure? Um. So we are, we are currently recording new or we are recording data in order to do this calibration. Uh, for now, we have only two days recording. That was really um, a recent result I presented. Uh, so I got those uh, only um, yeah, over the weekend now. Um, so let's uh, stay tuned and, and we will report a new result on that. Okay. I guess we continue then and I stop sharing. Yeah, but I, I, because I saw you, you closed uh, uh, before you, um, I think you still have some slides, do you want? Because we still Hello. have one minute. <laughs> uh, I'm done. So that was the last slide uh, I have shown. Uh, that's my last slide, so we were done. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, I rushed uh, fully the last one, sir. Okay, so I believe uh, there may be uh, questions in the chat box later for your talk, and uh, then you can uh, answer the question there. 